Hey everyone, welcome to Bridge to the Bay with Dr. Varis. I'm Dr. Matt Varis, and this is episode five with Dr. Anusha Ratnaswaran. Anusha is one of my best friends from grad school. She was actually a few years ahead of me, and her and her colleagues really sort of uh, set the bar for what me and my colleagues wanted to achieve in grad school. You know, get out big, impactful publications, attend world-renowned conferences, and sort of get that notoriety on the world stage, but really be able to do good science at its essence. So I learned a lot from Anusha, and so it was great to finally catch up and, you know, reminisce on a format sort of like this. And we both grew up in Canada, so we, we talk about that a little bit, and we talk about what really got her interested in science in the first place, which I thought was kind of interesting conversation. And Anusha also started off in uh, sort of a kinesiology program in her undergrad and transitioned into a more of a, a hard sciences biology program uh, in grad school. And that was a, a concerted effort, a choice on her part. And so we talk about why she made that choice. And it really comes down to wanting to help the patient as much as she can. Now, funding in grad school and in academia is kind of tight these days. So we talk about the funding climate and how that influenced her choice in taking a job with Health Canada. And we also talk about how sort of uh, incentives in academia can really select for certain types of behavior, certain types of people, and certain types of projects. And we talk about sort of the good and the bad associated with those. And uh, we kind of leave the conversation knowing when we want to talk about more. So I hope we can talk again soon. But if any of that sounds of interest, then enjoy. If not, hopefully one of the future episodes will be of interest. Thanks. Hey, Anusha, Dr. Ratnus Warren, how's it going? Good. How are you, Dr. Barris? Sounds weird hearing it come it, from you. It does. It sounds real. <laughs> it's so recent, but, you know, I'll take it. It's, it feels pretty good. I'm doing well. Can't complain, really. I'm out in the California sun. You can kind of see it there behind me. How's it over there in Canada? It's nice. We finally let in some Americans today across our border. It's the first day. Things are opening up in Toronto. Uh, signs are looking positive. And yeah, nothing nothing more to add. Hopefully they're not COVID positive, but yeah. Yes, that was a terrible <laughs> joke. <laughs> I got to break the ice with the dad jokes. All right. Well, thanks so much for doing this with me. I know it's not your favorite way to spend a Monday night. But I really appreciate it. You're one of my most impressive friends. I don't know if you believe me or not, but my your only friend. <laughs> no, you know my parents are my friends too. But just having the opportunity to sort of follow in your footsteps in grad school over at Western was really blessing. Is the only way I can put it. There's lots of things that I wasn't sure what the best way was to approach it, and just sort of using the model that you and you know some of the other people had said, like. Dr. Michael Pest, Dr. Matt McCann, you guys and the crew really sort of kind of took me under your wing while I was a, a young gun, a little wily, and you kind of shaped me into somewhat of a decent grad student at the time. So I really appreciate it. Thanks for that. It went from up here in the happy dad joke vibes to down here in serious and and you know that's very heartwarming and cute and i feel like it we the family we had it was like a family in grad school and i think that was really nice and we all helped each other out and we all struggled through some parts but um i think it was nice at the end of the day like we we're all going through the same experience together so it was definitely bond forming time yeah and hopefully this will go through those motions. You know, we'll have some some funny light jokes. We'll, we'll get through the seriousness. I think part of this podcast is trying to highlight the person behind the scientists. And I th I think that, I don't know, my perspective perhaps was a little naive as a kid or even coming into university of what a scientist was, you know, what the life is like, what that kind of person is like. But really, we're all just people. You know, we have our pros and cons. We have our blind spots and our strengths. And that's regardless of who you are, regardless of how successful, quote unquote, you are, you can have your weaknesses and, you know, you'll piss people off along the way as well. And so I just like to hopefully highlight the good of everyone, but show that there's, there's more complexity than just being able to 
you know, carry out the scientific method and, and pursue those questions diligently. So I kind of will just start it off with what's your background? Like, where'd you grow up? I guess kind of a good question I like to start with the scientists is when did you really fall in love with science? When, when did you really consider that as a thing? Some people, it was when they were really tiny. Some people, it was they were in undergrad still and, and they tried some research and fell in love with it there. Would you be able to give us a little background? Yeah, so, I mean, I grew up in Vaughan, Ontario. Um, nothing, I would say, that's too special about that. Um, but it, when I fell in love with science, I think it's been sort of throughout my life. There have been just the experiences that I've had growing up. I mean, when we were kids, there was Magic School Bus, Bell Nye the Science Guy, all of these shows that really expose you to that world, Beekman's world. You might be a little bit too Beekman's young for world? some of them shows. What is yeah. that? At, there was, it was a scientist and there was a rat, like a human dressed up as a rat, and it was a science show. I was quite young. I think you probably weren't born yet, but it was one of those things. They, it, it had a humorous take on science. They did experiments. I think it was sort of in the realm of Bill Nye, from what I remember. Um, but just sort of all of those experiences. And my dad also really loves science and how things work and nature. So I think that was a big part of um, influencing me and how I understood the world around me. I think one of my first favorite presents was my parents made a donation to the WWF World Wildlife Fund and they sent us these cards and on each of these cards was an animal, their geographic location, their diet, if they were prey or predator, what they ate, gestation period. I went through all of those animal cards and memorized them. I hid the spider ones obviously at the back because they scared just the shit out of me but yeah so it was sort of through nature i think was where i really developed an appreciation of science put that really well i don't know if i could pinpoint it so eloquently that way but i'm sure i was into science when i was young my mom was into it she really liked math and chemistry and i guess just encouraged looking into those things so it was kind of natural i guess for me and then i was a big nerd as a kid so it just felt natural that I'd, I'd end up in school for a while. I kind of always figured that much. What was it that you liked? Was it the biology of it? Or was it the sort of how things work, putting things together, taking things apart? Or was it something else? Like I'm trying to imagine high school Matt dissecting a fetal pig or titrating different acids and bases. And I don't know which one is the, the excited Matt. So I, I kind of liked it all. By the time I was in high school, I already thought I'd be like CEO of a company. So I, I was thinking not that I was going to be a scientist or something, although I enjoyed it. It was that I wanted to manage people and I wanted to manage projects. And I wanted to sell things and I wanted to build partnerships. And I still feel the same way, but I picked up some useful skills along the way, I would say. But I think the earliest profession I said I'd be was an engineer. And I did like taking things apart. But if I'm really honest, I think my brother was more of that type. And he would be the ones that would break the things as he takes them apart and not quite be able to put them together. So, you know, it was <laughs> I had to be careful with the fancy things I had and kind of hide them from him. Otherwise, he'd want to take a look. But he learned a lot and he ended up repairing iPhones and Blackberries when smartphones first became a thing. And he made a ton of money off of it, learned a lot. So... Yeah, so he did that. For me, I think it was more human centric. I'm a, I'm team human. That's something I found myself saying a lot recently. But I think that was the case when I was a kid as well. I just really found people fascinating. I think we're the coolest animal. I think we're very much animals as well. And I think a lot of people forget that in the modern day. And that I wanted to know why they behave in certain ways and why they think the way they do. Is that advantageous? Is there a reason? Why are we the way we are? My family was a little chaotic growing up. And so I think that was part of just trying to pinpoint like, what, why? Like it's, why would you act that way? And I, I always had this feeling like there's got to be a reason. These people aren't just sort of making these haphazard chaotic decisions for no reason. You, you were looking for reason and madness. Yes, yes. And uh, kind of 
what really clicked for me was in biology in, in grade 12. I had a great biology teacher, Miss Abbott was her name. And this was like one of the last, like near the end of the school year, one of the last assignments she had us do was she laid out all these scientific papers of sort of like the early hominids. So like, uh, what is it? Like Australopithecus was like before the Homo genus. And then you start with like Homo habilis, I think. And then Homo erectus, which is when we were standing on two feet. And then a new one that came out is Homo heidelbergensis, I think. And that is the most recent ancestor with humans. And then Homo sapiens recently after. And these papers were sort of where they found the initial descriptions and like, you know, there, there were fossils in a cave. It's just like the story of it, I thought was really cool. It's kind of like a mystery or something. But when you piece it together, you can start to see like, okay, us humans didn't just show up magically in isolation. It was, there was these other animals, these other creatures that evolved and mutated and sort of narrowed in on the characteristics that made us homo sapiens sapiens. And that really turned me on to biology and sort of genetics and showed me that we can understand the human journey, at least through genetics, which I thought was really cool. I always wanted to learn more about my heritage. And uh, then when I hit first year bio with uh, Tom Haffey, I don't, you wouldn't have had him, right? Because you didn't do undergrad at Western, but he was notorious in first year biology when we had like a thousand kids in the lecture hall. He would get like, he would ask a question every year. How many of you think you're going to be a doctor? And like everyone puts up their hand. And he's like, well, that's not true for like 90% of you. And then like there's just silence across the whole class. And then people like questioning, you know, their self-worth and all this. But I sort of became friends with him later on. And he really honestly did that as a favor to kids. Because a lot of people sort of just have med school on their mind. And then when they don't make it, they don't know what to do. And they think they're a failure, that they didn't do something right. Like that was the only option for them and they couldn't even do that. But really, when once you get later on, you kind of learn what it is to be a doctor. That a doctor is not just one thing either. There's different sort of sub-professions you can take on that really it's not for everyone. And you shouldn't be doing something that you don't enjoy just because, you know, your parents or society or whoever thinks it's a good idea or, or it has like a high profile or something in society. Because again, you know, they're just people. And sometimes being a doctor is, is really difficult, re really stressful. It's a long path. So it's not for everyone. And he was just trying to highlight, like, for those of you that are not dead set on it, start looking elsewhere now and it'll, it'll work out for you. So for me, I kind of internalized that. I wasn't phased. I just kind of enjoyed that someone would shock people like that because I could tell a bunch of you people around me. would enjoy that, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of people around me were crushed, and I was like, oh, he did that on purpose. So yeah, that, that was when I learned about genetics and epigenetics, and that just set me on a path like, okay, this is what I got to study, and I'll take it as far as I can. And then that's kind of what I did. Not Ferris career path. There's a bird that just flew right behind your head. It was um, it looked like it flew through from one year to the other. <laughs> <laughs> that's my thought bird. He's leaving. Yes, it's the Tom Haffey bird. Yeah, I think he retired recently. But I just I'm kind of curious about that science thing. I want to look this up later. The rat. Wh what was that show called again? Beekman's World. Beekman's World. Do you think that was like a Canadian version of Bill Nye or something? You know what? I don't know. Um, but it was, I mean, instead of having an animated rat, there was a person dressed up as a rat running around, um, you know, Beekman and stuff. So it could be the budget version of um, Bill Nye, perhaps. Yeah. I'm just thinking because there was what, Mr. Rogers and there was Mr. Dress Up. I think Mr. Rogers was the American one and Mr. Dressup was a Canadian one or something to that effect. But they were essentially the same guy or the same premise, 
just one was the Canadian budget version. I remember like Beekman's world being more of a, like a funny, like humorous take on science. So you could be right. And maybe they were a similar concept and run by different I don't know, companies or even Canadian version. But yeah, I just remember one being sort of the humorous, maybe is more kid oriented take and the other one being more inquiry based take, which was Bill Nye. Yeah. Bill Nye was clutch. He, I think he taught a lot of us science when our science teachers were hungover. But yeah, that's good. Okay, so I, ca- I want to ask about your high school experience and sort of what you were thinking about getting to college. But just in terms of the destination we're getting to, maybe in your words, how do we know each other? Just so people listening can kind of know. Yeah, so I mean, I would say we knew each other from grad school at Western. Mm-hmm. And I think the first time I met you, I was probably already in my PhD or had just transferred perhaps into my PhD and you were a summer student uh, working in the lab next door. And as you are right now, you had on these big headphones, which are essentially the keep me out headphones. They're the like, I'm going to do stuff. So don't talk to me headphones. Um, and I'm like, okay, cool, cool. Like person next door doesn't want to be talked to. Carry on. But then I think as like the longer you dwell in our little office that we had, it's like the more everyone sort of opens up and sort of just gets used to each other and amalgamates with each other. And that's how we got to know each other. And I think we had a lot of fun experiences too in grad school, going to conferences and on trips and celebrating people's defenses and all of that. But um, yeah, that's how we know each other. What, do you have a different take on it? <laughs> no, you, you put that great. And yeah, I haven't worn big headphones like that in a while since the AirPods came out. I kind of feel, I'm feeling a little nostalgic for it. I used to love those things. But see, you got the message that I was, I was in a zone. Don't bother me. But a lot of people still try and like reach out and grab me and bug me and like are yelling at me and like confused when I don't respond or something or someone upset that they called my name and I was walking down the hallway and they were behind me. Like, I didn't hear that. I'm listening to rap music on maximum. There's no way. Drizzy Drake's playing in the background and I'm (laughs) trying to moonwalk through the hallways. But yeah, I was probably 20 years old and a summer student when I met you. And yeah, you probably had just transferred from like the master's to the PhD. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get back to there, but I guess people can kind of guess that you took a trajectory somehow from high school all the way through to a PhD. So could you maybe talk a little bit about what was going through your mind near the end of high school? Did you, what were you thinking about when you were preparing for university? Did you know you were going to go right away? Did you have an idea of where you were going to go? What were your parents saying to you? What were your friends doing? That kind of thing. Yeah. So it's funny because I think I knew I had the idea that I was going to go to university. I didn't necessarily know what for. I had a scholarship to go do a business program. And it was a very good program at a university here in Ontario. And I also was accepted into a couple different universities for science programs. And Again, I think my dad was like to me, like, oh, you could, you know, go to learn about macroeconomics and microeconomics like me and or you could like go be like the people on the Discovery Channel. And if one day you realize you want to go back to some economic stuff, then you can always do that at a different time. So uh, that's sort of when I chose to pursue science for university Um, and I did my undergrad in math. And I did at Mac, how it worked at the time was you went into like a general science program for a year. And then after the first year, you chose your specialization. So at that time, I was like, hmm, after year one, what courses do I want to take? And I was like, cool, anatomy and physiology, cool, sports injuries, cool, whatever. And so then I went to the department that was offering these courses. And I was like, oh, hey, can you let me into these courses? And they were like, well you know, you can take these courses if you transfer into our program. And I said, do I have to do anything to transfer into your program? And they said, no, your grades look fine. Like you should just transfer and you can take all these courses with none of the hassle. So 
that was how I transferred into kinesiology. And I mean, I think that program lined up very well with my interests, which are human health. And I got to learn about all sorts of interesting things related to chronic health and disease and preventative health. And I think that's really shaped who I was as a person before going into grad school and what I was interested in. And I think, you know, when you look at what I chose to do research in for grad school, which was osteoarthritis, a lot of it relates back to what I learned in undergrad. Yeah, and I kind of remember you just talking about what you picked up in kinesiology, and you, you kind of worked with patients a little bit. Is, is that true? So that was so after undergrad, I actually went and I worked in cardiac rehab at Women's College Hospital in Toronto for a little bit, and um, we worked with patients. And the patients, they you know had multiple morbidities sometimes, and one of the most common ones being was. Um, osteoarthritis or this degeneration. Um, and that was kind of sort of maybe like a eureka moment for me where it was like, oh, you know, these patients, they can't derive the full benefit from their cardiac rehab program because they have these MSK conditions that are preventing them from that. And it made me want to go do MSK research because I felt there was a subset of the population that, you know, was like this, they had multiple morbidities and they had MSK conditions that sort of prevented them from having that full spectrum of health. And like, they kind of reminded me of them, my mom and my aunts, right? Like a lot of the women in this program, they were sort of the first generation of women that worked full time in their family while also doing many of the things around the house. And so their health um, took a back seat. And so it, it sort of really resonated, their stories, their stories really resonated with me, I think, in that way. And yeah, that's sort of the Cole's notes of why I, you know, wanted to do OA research. Yeah. Cool. I was going to ask a cheeky question. Was there any sort of like stigma around going into kinesiology from sort of like the physical sciences in that it was like science for jocks or something? Because I feel like there was a bit of that at Western? Yeah, so I think when I was doing it, it was not that it was new, because obviously, phys like, you know, physical sciences or physical activity sciences, kinesiology, sports science has been a long, around for a long time. But specifically the year that I went into kin at Mac, that's where the physiology courses were, and they didn't come out with a physiology program until the subsequent year. So I think at McMaster, there wasn't that stigma, at least in that time. I think after I graduated, I got the stigma of like, oh, you were in this like sport program where all you do is play sports. And like, I didn't play one sport and I took science courses. Okay. So yeah, it's a little different then. It's a hardcore legit program at Mac, but I definitely do know people that in their undergrad in Kines, they got a grade for playing sports or, you know, mastering a technique in a sport or something. So you definitely knew your stuff. So they must have taught you something along the way or you picked it up on your own. Somewhere. There was absorption somewhere. Hard to tell where. No, there were a lot of great courses that I think that I took there and that stuck with me even to this day. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So overall, rounding out your undergrad degree, uh, what did you think of your time at Mac? And I guess... Uh, yeah, how were you making that decision to go into that sort of, what was it, cardiac rehab you were saying? And then sort of from there, how did you decide what you were going to do next? That's a tough question. Um, so I really enjoyed my time at Mac. I thought I learned a lot. I thought there were a lot of experiences that I got to do that contributed to my education that were just classes. So I had TA for anatomy and physiology. And I almost think that teaching and preparing for teaching in that course taught me like a lot, not necessarily more than in class, but it definitely supplemented your knowledge in a way. And I also got to work as a prosector for the anatomy and physiology labs there. So in the summer, um, we would help prepare the bodies um, for teaching and education that people had to clean. Yeah, it is eyebrow raised, right? But like, I mean, you got to think it doesn't when you go into an anatomy lab, 
like the body that, that you see or the body parts that you see, you see a leg and you see like the nerve that matches up with how it does in the textbook and the muscle fibers exposed, like someone has to do all that, right? They have to dissect it and pro- prepare it in a way that, yeah. So the med students get all spoiled. It gets served to them on a silver platter, so to speak. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very intricate and involves a lot of preparation. But I think that, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why with um, anatomy things, I was more in my comfort zone in grad school, where as for other things, I did need to do a little bit catching up on that other people had more of a background on it. Like in some basic science aspects, there were so many people who had done an undergrad in genetics or an undergrad in biology and you know, their knowledge is very different than mine. And then as for, you know, the transition to grad school, I think I I graduated from undergrad not really knowing what I was going to do and thinking that, hey, you know, I'm going to work in my field and, you know, maybe I'll be able to work in some sort of sports medicine concept context or something like that. And, you know, I looked for a job. I worked at Sunnybrook doing stuff with patient records. I worked, and then I found the job in cardiac rehab, which I thought was a lot of fun and very educational, but your first sort of entry-level job isn't always the permanent one, right? Like, you know, when you, anytime you enter any job, you're sort of assessing, like, can I grow here? Is there room for me? And I think in that specific position, even though, like, team was great. Patients were great. I was hired, I think, as part of someone's replacement for mat leave. So I knew that, you know, eventually this experience is going to come to an end. And I started thinking about more what I wanted to do long term in my career. And my experience with those patients was sort of like, hey, you know, here's a need. Um, People need help with musculoskeletal conditions. And right now there's sort of nothing we can do for them. Can I do research in this area to sort of address that need? And that was the thought process behind that and why I wanted to go to grad school. Yeah. Well, it's nice that you sort of identified an area sort of like in the real world, so to speak, and then could go back and then do the mad science to advance it. I definitely didn't think that far sort of my entry into grad school or research was I, you know, worked in my old boss's lab in undergrad doing some genetic studies and had a lot of fun. It was very technical and detail oriented and a little hardcore at times. And I enjoyed that. And I was like, okay, I could do this a little longer. I like looking at the genes. And for me, it was more like, I want to deal with the technologies and the specifics of the position or even the disease or whatever I was studying was less important than, okay, what's state of the art that I can play with at this university? What, what will they let me touch? Yeah. And I can see that. Like, I feel like you say that, Hey, I didn't really have this idea. I just sort of started undergrad, but it always seemed like you were driven Like, it didn't ever seem like you were just doing something for the sake of doing something. It always sort of seemed to fit into Matt's greater, you know, purpose. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I I, I don't know. Maybe I think of things a little differently than most people. But even if I don't know the exact end destination, I have like a feeling of this little thing. This is going to be important. It maybe seems small now. Maybe it's early. But to me, I I can see that this might be something. And so I'm going to learn about that. And so I would pick up those skills along the way. And it was things, you know, in in genetics or a little bit of uh, bioinformatics, a little computer programming there, sometimes a little business education. Whatever it was, it was, was, I was almost compelled to look into things that to me felt could be useful when I'm an adult that I can learn now and then not have to waste time you know, learning it later. Because I think a lot of people specialize, 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 get a job in their field and they're working and they're going and then they look up and they're like 35, 40 years old and they have kids or something and they're like, damn, I got to go take some night 
courses or something. I got to go get an extra certificate or something like that. And I, for some reason, have this like horror that I would have to go back. I hate revisiting things. Like I, I can't read a book twice or watch a movie twice. Like I just can't do, you know, things more than once. It, it really bothers me. I, I have to sometimes, but I really try to avoid it when I can. And that goes with education too. So if I could see it, I'm going to try and grab it. Do you feel like the role of intuition in science and, and career planning is overlooked? Because I feel like you're talking a lot about intuition helping you, you know, realize stuff down the road. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of intuition. And I'm going to say that I feel confident in that because the man I heard it from first was Albert Einstein. And I can't remember the quote, I'll butcher it if I try and quote it, but it was something to the effect of you need to cultivate your intuition because it's processing things you're not aware of, but you can learn to listen to it and it can take you in the right direction. So I think in Einstein's case, it was more like he would get stuck on a theory or a concept for a long time and like he, would, he didn't have it, but he had a feeling that with a little more effort, if you found that missing piece, he could get over the hurdle and then everything would sort of become clear. And I definitely operate in that same way. And Are I you think, calling yourself Einstein? No, no. You can call me that. That's fine. But he was kind of the first person I cared to learn about. Like I read his biographies. I read the, um, it was some sort of abridged version of the theory of relativity when I was like eight, just because... Einstein was cool to me. I liked that his hair was all nuts too. But I think many scientists can become allergic to sort of intuition because they can feel like it's sort of, that it's a feeling that's driving their decision making. And many scientists are very much driven by the data. Like, you know, I got to do the experiments. I got to have the data in front of me and then I can make the call. But not every decision in life is, can be made that way. And if you do, sometimes it'll be, it'll take 10 years for you to get that information and then you just missed out on whatever those 10 years could have been. And to me, I'm not someone that uh, likes to wait around. And I, I have trusted my gut, my intuition. I think my dad operates that way and also made it sort of emboldened me to act that way. And sort of the people I admired had, had operated that way. And to me, I, I personally feel that if you can cultivate your intuition, you can be more than just whatever your rote knowledge is. You can start to find those opportunities to pursue that people would overlook or you can um, pursue a line of thinking or inquiry that maybe seems weird to most people because most people aren't thinking about it. But you know, you might find that a strength in that, oh, no one's looked into it yet. And you can sort of shine your light and look into it on your own. So I, I definitely believe in intuition. I think a lot of young scientists are perhaps taught to shy away from it, but I, th I think that's a mistake. You got to cultivate the scientific method and inquiry alongside with, with your humanness. That's a big part of what it is to be human. You can't make all your decisions consciously. And, and I think you can be really profound what our unconscious can do. And I believe I've seen that firsthand many times. So I'm going to stick to that. What do you think? I'm going to say I don't really see them as separate. I feel like my intuition is just data driven. I feel like the more information and knowledge I can have about something, it guides my decisions, even though it's not necessarily just that. I feel like when you take a step back, the more information, I don't know how to explain it, I think in, in proper words, but I think for my intuition, I feel better and my subconscious makes better decisions and is more comfortable with them with the more information I have. And I think I take that approach to many of my decisions in life. I, I don't necessarily think it takes away from it. So you're saying like, given the data in front of you, you're still going to go with your gut? Is it the data is not going to tell you everything you need or? I'm saying my gut helps process the data. 
not necessarily, not in like a scientific decision, but I feel like in a life decision or yeah, like in a life decision, right? Like, you know, some people make pros and cons lists, right? This is just another way of, you know, telling your brain you have all of these options and here are the benefits and, you know, the deficiencies in those options. It's, I mean, I think some people make those lists and some people instead they have a gut feeling. And then I think some people use both of those and one aids the other, right? Like, I think probably too, you can think of circumstances where you've had a gut feeling and then you have external information that aids that gut feeling, right? And it either eases it or, you know, it cements it. And I think this is normal for for all of us. I also almost think it's sort of like a scientist's way of thinking where more information makes you more comfortable. It's obviously not necessarily always true because sometimes you have too much information and that's overwhelming. But yeah, personally. I've heard a bunch of podcasters talk about this sort of recently, but the idea that sort of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain are designed slightly differently or optimized for slightly different things. I think it's the the right hemisphere is more to deal with the unknown, things that you don't know, and things that are, I guess, concepts that you might not even be able to articulate, but it can do that sort of processing. And then the left brain, your right hand, that would be the more organized, orderly thoughts. And that's like the knowledge that you can refer to, that you're aware of. You can go check it against you know what you know but really depending on the circumstance you might have to use one or the other or both and they're two different modes of interact or two different modes of driving behavior i guess and they're you know adaptive depending on the circumstance but just having one isn't good enough and just having the other isn't good enough it's when we could use both that that's where the real magic happens. I think that's maybe where humans start to differentiate from the rest of animals that I think, you know, all mammals will have the two hemispheres, but then us humans have a really gigantic prefrontal neocortex that sort of like is on top of the two layers and it can do some extra processing above. And that's to me, I think that's like the intellectual part of us that it almost relays between the two modes of thinking. And that can drive our decision making. So I guess it makes sense to me that you'd use both. I, I definitely agree in that. But I totally feel comfortable making decisions on feel when there's no data available. And being okay with that decision. Even if the data comes after the result I would expect. That's perhaps like an egotistical thing. I'm too confident perhaps in, in some respects. But again, I've also seen like sometimes you just need to make the bet and just see how it plays out and hope for the best. And sometimes it's just making that decision early on not enough information that sets you up for a nice result in the end. And if you would have waited, you don't even get the opportunity. Yeah. But I, to me, it's almost like uh, they, they can be successive after another, or like iterative. Like I have a feeling that I do a little research based on that feeling and then think about it a little while and then it, you know it points me in another direction so maybe it's more like the feeling side is like the directionality and then you got to do the hard work in the details as you're progressing something to that effect yeah but I, I like that you asked that because i've had more and more of these conversations with my friends the last year or two i think during the pandemic as well it's had people think a little more deeply than normal and for me, that's really important. I, I always like to think deeply and talk about emotions and feelings and all that, especially when we're scientists, because I think, you know, I find it's a muscle I need, I need to exercise. Otherwise, to me, I get like a little depressed if I don't have the creativity and the emotional aspect sort of stimulated, then I, I start shirking my responsibilities in the lab and stuff. I need to go have some fun, do things like this. Yeah, and I think really the best scientists or whatever it is, the the people that are the best at it go by feel to some degree. They have to. 
there's no way you could intellectualize everything. No, and I think it goes back to what you were saying before. Sometimes you make you have to make decisions when you don't have all the information or you can't wait for all the information. And the timing of that decision is really important, right? So, yeah, I think, you know, the better and more practiced you are at that intuition, the better outcomes you may have. And I think, I agree, some of the best scientists in the world are very good at making that work for them. Yeah, I know even like George Church at Harvard, he's like the biggest guy in genetics. He has narcolepsy, so he just falls asleep randomly. And he says the majority of his ideas come up like in those narcoleptic moments. So like either as he's falling into sleep or coming out of it, he's in that sort of like loosey goosey mental state where I guess like new connections can start forming and then he awakens and it's like, Oh, I got an idea. And then he can go write it down and, and pursue it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but you know, he uses that as a creative outlet which I thought is fascinating. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I've always thought that my best ideas, like at least when I'm writing, they happen when I'm in the shower, right? Like when you're, yeah, right? When so I was writing my thesis, I had to like make sure that I take those moments seriously. Mm-hmm. You're like, must remember, right, right on hand. And I'm going to remember this when I get out because it's like you're not so focused and you're sort of taking a step back. And I think that subconscious processing of it, you're like, aha, this is what I've been looking for. Yeah. And I've read like some CEOs do that on purpose as well. Like they set aside time for like idea time or something where it's like, I'm going to set aside two or three hours. Because often when you're a boss of people in, in, in general, whatever, at whatever level, having to deal with like, minute to minute decisions or when your calendar is all filled, there's, it leaves little room for creativity. And sometimes your brain needs like a little break, like the shower. It's like, I'm not doing anything else. This is for me right now. I don't got to worry about stressors or whatever. And then the ideas just flow freely. So some people have to set that time aside on purpose just to be creative. Even if nothing comes of it, have some free blocks of time to just let the mind be free. Yeah. So where were we then? You were thinking about going to grad school, right? Because you saw these multiple morbidities. OA is a big problem. So what did you do with that sort of idea? Yeah, um, I reached out to different professors at um, different universities. I knew that I... I was comfortable sort of with going to a couple of cities, including Toronto, Hamilton, London, sort of Waterloo area. So not too far away, but I also wanted, I knew I wanted a big lab because I think I, I like that environment. I like, you know, lots of people, lots of ideas, lots of projects bouncing around. Um, obviously, you know, you want a well-funded environment, so you have the opportunity to pursue projects you like, but also to go to conferences. So I was reaching out to different professors asking about the research, and I reached out to, you know, Frank at Western, and he said, you know, come meet the lab, see what we do. And it sort of just, yeah, was not serendipitous. I think I put in the work researching and looking at different sort of places where I could fit. And, and this one worked out. I knew when I met the lab, it was the right environment. I sort of had that intuition. I think it seemed like the people there really worked together well and they got along really well and they had, you know, various interests and they were all pursuing them. They also came from various academic backgrounds. So that was important to me too, coming from kinesiology. It's like, am I going to a lab that has all biochemists and I'm not going to fit in, right? And I think when when I went to the lab, um, Ryan, who was a master's student at the time and finishing up, who is now an orthopedic surgeon, he was also from kinesiology. So I was like, okay, kinesiology students can, you know, do all of this genetics, basic science stuff because I had never taken part in wet lab research before. So that was important to me knowing that, you know, I could potentially be successful in that avenue. 
Um, yeah, and the decision was made pretty quickly. I think I attended a lab meeting that same day that I went for a visit. And yeah, for those, anyone that's trying to look at a lab, if you can sneak into a lab meeting, it's a great way to be a fly on the wall, right? Get to get an eye on the dynamic. That That's really important, right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, obviously lab meetings, they're very different between many labs. And I think our lab meeting, it was super informal. You know, people were talking about their research. People were saying what they had coming up, but there were no hard, hard sort of deadlines or strange sort of follow-ups. And there weren't really any formal presentations except for someone had a thesis presentation coming up. So they did that and it just felt comfortable. And I think that's for any, you know, student that's going to pursue grad school, it's where you spend the majority of your life for those few years. So finding a comfortable environment is very important. Yeah. And do you think that was something that Frank Beyer, for anyone that's listening along, that was something that Frank himself built? Or do you think it was something organic that came from the people that were put together? I think both. I think it does start with, with the PI. And I think it starts with choosing people who fit into a culture that you want to establish in the lab, right? Like we talk about that a lot in employment, certain companies, certain places you work, having the right culture. But that's not as much talked about in the lab space, although it's starting to. But I think it starts from the PI building a culture that's sort of like open and collegial and selecting people with the right traits and informing them early on, one of the most important parts to your success in graduate school is, you know, contributing to this culture and, you know, being respectful of others and all of the other things that come with interacting and sharing a workspace over time. So both. You you select for traits and then hopefully it develops organically from like, you know, from that. But if you don't do the initial step, it's very unlikely that the result is going to turn out that way. And I, I would say you exemplified that throughout the time of grad school that I knew you. Like you were you were running councils and volunteering and setting up all these, you know, extracurriculars. You were like sort of helping the younger people with whatever it was. Like you're involved in so many different ways. It wasn't just doing the experiments and going home. It was, it was covering all the bases, being part of, Part of that community as well and i know that rubbed off on me which i really appreciated and it also made my time a lot more enjoyable the fact that you and your other colleagues were able to sort of build that collegiality out even beyond the walls of the lab further out into the department or you know in the, in the school at large and we really felt that and we tried to keep it going i don't know how successful we were but it was really nice to see I, I think you were like you guys were successful for your generation of, of grad school, definitely. And I think it comes from also the people before me, right? That's what they did. And again, part of that culture was, you know, when we have our, was it Monday seminars that we went to? We had, we had our Monday, I think Monday afternoon Fizz Farm seminars, maybe not Monday. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with Monday. And we all sort of went when we could, and we especially went when there was another grad student presenting because we were supporting, you know, one of our own. And I haven't necessarily seen that culture everywhere, but I think something like that is so important because you're supporting one of your own team members. People are becoming more confident presenting. You yourself are learning how other people are presenting. And you're also exposing yourself to, you know, different fields of science, different techniques of science, which is all a big part of our learning in grad school too. So I think that's one thing we did really well. And sort of now that I'm away from there, it gives me warm fuzzies because it was nice that we all supported each other in that way. Yeah, it was a really nice environment. And when you and, and the other crew sort of in your era started to depart, we, we definitely felt a loss there. Um, I don't know if we kept it up quite to the same level. I think the people that were left were just a bit different in general, but we tried to keep what we could. And that collegiality and that those interpersonal relationships really help, I think, especially 
they can help in grad school and in science when things are really difficult and like 99% of what you do doesn't work. You need support and people around you to, to help you through that, to let you know that that's okay. This happens to everybody. It's not just you. You're not that special. We all fail as well and that you'll be okay. Something will work and that'll be enough and you can pursue that. That was really big. So appreciate it. And yeah, I agree. I agree. That's a good thing. And that it's not necessarily the case everywhere. That was a huge strength of those labs. And I think that department as well in general, his farm. Yeah. Okay. So you went, you went to this lab meeting and you thought, great, I'm going to go be a doctor in his farm. Right. I thought I'm going to go get my master's in, in this farm. And I mean, yeah, I think part of continuing to do a PhD was I really liked my project. That was one reason. And I think I would almost be jealous if at that stage someone else took it over for me. So I think both of those factors led me to transfer into a PhD. And I think that was a great decision just in terms of learning, but also in terms of personal growth. I think you grow a lot as a person through grad school and sort of, you know, you look at the science and you're like, okay, cool. I'm designing my own experiments. I'm going through with them. But then you also, there's like success and there's great success, but there's also failures and learning from those failures. And sometimes you're responsible for just yourself. Sometimes you're responsible for a team of people. So all of those experiences cumulatively definitely teach you a lot about how to plan, how to, you know, deal with other people, how to set expectations, just all of that. It, it sounds generic, but I think, you know, you've gone through the same thing. So, you know, yeah. Oh, it's real. It's because it's so extreme. Like you can do these things and yeah, for like a, a not intense situation, it's easy for people to manage, but like when most of what you do fails and there's not much to look forward to, but you still have to hit goals. What do you do? You got to learn resiliency and you got to learn what you can to manage. But when you're in the trenches there in grad school, it, it teaches you how to deal with the, those circumstances. So hopefully when you experience them later on, first of all, either you've prepared for them, so it's not as much of a pitfall, but also that you know you can be resilient and get through whatever the circumstance is. And, um, and I think that's useful for anyone that goes through it. And it, it's not just unique to grad school necessarily, but I do think that it is a great way and a great opportunity to do that for many people, especially if they're, they align with sort of scientific disciplines. Would you, being where you are now, recommend doing a PhD to most people that are interested? Or just in general, maybe not even people that are interested, but you know, you're sitting in that same first year class that you were, and people, you know, put their hands up saying, I want to go to vet school. I want to go to med school. I want to go to dental school. I want to go to grad school. And, and you're the professor on the other side telling people, hey, this is what I would recommend. It would be a very specific case. I think I would recommend it, but there would be huge like asterisks with it. So you just got to know what you're getting into. I think a lot of people don't. It's really important to find the right environment because you're going to be stuck there for a while. And you might be year two or three and things are so terrible that you want to leave. But if you leave now, you get nothing out of it. And then you sort of kind of wasted two or three years. So it's really important that you do the due diligence before you even start. So it's not something to be taken lightly. So that'd be the first advice I'd give. But I would say that if there's a big goal you're aiming for in life and you know there's a ceiling that you'd hit that wouldn't allow you to get there and that having that piece of paper that says you're a doctor or you're an expert or whatever it is can get you past that ceiling, 
then that's one of the cases where you should do it. Now, if the decision is, I don't know what I'm doing and you know, I could just kick it in school for another five to seven years, I would say that's not a good decision. And it's not a good decision because first of all, the idea that going through grad school and getting a professorship coming out of it, which is what they train you for. They haven't adjusted the material or, you know, how professors teach or even who teaches. So they're all trained in a way just in academia. That's all they know how to do. That's the skills you're going to learn, but there's no jobs anymore. And if there is, you got to travel really far. And now it's even difficult to get a deal where two partners can go to the same institution, right? Which is ridiculous to me. It used to be a thing where you'd bring in, you know, a top tier scientist. And if their partner was a scientist too, then they'd get a package together. And that's, to me, that seems like a win-win. And those, the, you know, if the, that couple has kids, those kids have a stable environment and they win as well. And I think that's really important. I do put a precedent on that. But, you know, if the career prospects are not in academia, then you really have to think it through ahead of time. Because you're not going to just be in the middle of the wash cycle and then have an epiphany and then just change your lifestyle in a way that gets you a job. It's If you don't have that direction coming in, I think it's really difficult to find it. People do, but you have to buy in at whatever stage and really go for the goal that you're going for and then take the steps necessary to get there. Because if you just sort of are on the wheel, you're going to publish papers, sure, but you're probably not going to get a job and you might not even get a good postdoc like that because you, you got to do some networking and things in the meanwhile as well. So I would say it's definitely a good thing for some people in the right circumstances, but I think there's, we're creating far too many PhDs and I think that creates a larger societal problem too. Something that I've sort of read about. I don't know how true it is, but that, having a society full of educated poor people without career prospects creates a lot of tension in society, a lot of nihilism. And honestly, I think many of us can agree that that's showing up sort of in the zeitgeist currently. There's a lot of millennials, people sort of like, you know, younger adults, just really without a lot of hope and a lot of just wanting to tear everything down. And I think it's all part of a larger system. You know, the aspect of that where I do agree with you is that in terms of PhD training, yeah, it largely hasn't evolved in, in many years where, you know, students are being recruited in. They think at the end they're going to get a professor position that's tenured as it was, you know, many years ago. And, you know, for supervisors for labs like yeah having a phd student or a postdoc someone who's very highly educated doing technically difficult things is is very valuable but for the student on the other end there needs to be value in their education too and so there has to be more than coming out of that at the end with you know very small specific chances to do things such as get a professorship or a certain competitive industry position or something like that. And yeah, the, the training versus the output is very different because, you know, you're recruiting in all these students and training them and they are coming out educated with a variety of skills, but they don't know what for and they don't necessarily know how to apply that to the industries they're, they're looking for. I also did want to pause rewind to my answer before when you were asking how Anusha went from, from master's to PhD. And I, I said that, you know, during my master's, I, you know, I really liked my project. So part of me really wanted to stay and continue on with that project. And I would have almost been jealous if someone else had taken it over. But I think I was in a way like first year Matt, where I didn't know, necessarily know what all the career opportunities were after a master's degree or after grad school. And part of me thought that, you know, med school was the only way to get a stable career after graduate school. So that was where I thought I was headed before, 
you know, embarking on the PhD route and sort of seeing that there are so many different ways that you can go after PhD training, but also hoping now from where I stand, like I wish some of those things that I know now were integrated into my training and um, trainees could have exposure to them and have some experiential learning on their end. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of this I complained about while I was in grad school and the school just didn't really have the the resources or the know-how to really implement it. They're really stuck just doing one thing. It's not an adaptable place, unfortunately. Like, I think they want to, and I think they're trying to, but I think the how do we get there is, is very difficult. Um, and not just for them as a grad school, but for other grad schools as well, right? Because it's not like they were taught differently. And sometimes I think the only thing they can do is invite back alumni who are in different positions and ask them, you know, how they got there or what that career path was. And they're sort of stuck with how things are funded and how do we, you know, let a trainee go for a certain number of months to go do this experiential learning? How does this work in terms of their scholarships their projects, maybe they have an animal project, right? And, and so we think that, you know, once once they start doing it and once they figure out a system, I don't think these things will prove to be big barriers. And I think there will be a lot of value added, but I think until it starts being implemented and it's more widely used, it will always seem like that barrier that can't be, you know, provided for or addressed. Or I don't know, do you have any recommendations on how grad schools go about putting experiential learning into their curriculum or if it's like a thesis-based master's or a thesis-based PhDs. I mean, I went off for a couple months to go do a project elsewhere. And I know a few of my friends did too, but those were externally funded. So it's difficult how to see how a grad school could implement this curriculum. Yeah. Well, I have strong opinions. You know me. My main problem is universities currently are way too bloated, way too administrative heavy, and decision-making is driven by the administrators. So when you give an administrator a problem, their solution is hire another administrator to administer that problem. And then when that inevitably doesn't work, then the new administrator hires a new administrator to admit, administrate the new so-called problem that they've created from all of the paperwork that they've created. And so I have a direct example of that, which again, I complained about for years that really what matters is networking and the people you know. There's thousands of people that have graduated from these departments over time. And they should all be invited back. There should be a list. There should be yearly mixers surrounded about this. This should be an investment at the university or departmental level to cultivate the alumni as a thing everywhere. Any place where they can cultivate a network for the people that come into it, they should. That's done at Ivy League schools. That's done in fraternity and sororities. It's done in... You know, in the business world, it's done through management consulting firms. Like, honestly, people show up there at, like, a low level. They get to know everyone sort of at the senior levels, and those people work with every company on the planet, and then they all meld minds together. It's about who you know, not what you know. And that's what should be cultivated. Unfortunately, that's not what universities are good at. What they're built for is we're going to administer the same thing to everyone. We're going to create curricula. We're going to create PowerPoints and PDFs and we're going to create paperwork that people can sign and, you know, can waste their life away doing that. And so when I was complaining that there was no effort to cultivate alternative career paths to academia in grad school, the university's answer was something called own your future. And yeah, I'll, I'll use it by name because I don't give a shit. I went, I was a part of this and I was complaining as I was part of it in that it was just a front 
for so the the point of the the program was to create resources and learning opportunities for people to pursue careers outside of academia. In practice, what it was was they hired a couple administrators. I think it was at least two. It might have been more. And you can picture that these people are making probably 100k a year. So that's a couple of hundred k out. You can do a lot with a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And then they design these little modules that are like networking, setting goals, like creative writing or something like that. And it's like, okay, all of these were like workshops in undergrad at the university already. So you just cloned it and then coded it in the name grad school or whatever. And second of all, it's not the, the point. It doesn't help anyone to go sit in a classroom again and look at slides of how you network. That is the most antithetical way you can go about expanding someone's network or teaching them how to network. It's so upside down. I, I really could not grasp how ridiculous that was. And no one was saying anything about it. And that includes... And he was like, you should say something. I'm like, I did. I am. I have. Nothing's happening. And no one thinks it's as serious as I do. But that's because none of them are looking at the situation at, for what it is. They're just going about their day. And no one can really take that step back to, to design something that actually works because it's a lot of work. I, I'm going to say in, in Toronto, there are, I think, very complementary programs, um, at least in science, to help network and in terms of experiential learning. I don't know if they were driven by the university or just supported by the University of Toronto, but one of them is the Life Science Career Development Society. So they set up like a bunch of um, networking nights throughout the year with different industry and nonprofit and government um, alumni from U of T that have done PhDs or postdocs or masters. And they set up little pub nights where it's almost like speed dating and you go around tables and you get to network with these folks. Uh, they also have a mentorship program. So if there's a field that you're interested in, you can be matched up with a mentor in that same area, either virtually, now virtually, but before also in person. And, you know, they can help you talk about your career interest with a CV resume, et cetera. And they also do a, like a case study, a team case study where if you apply for this case study, you're put into groups of around four people. You choose an area, either medical affairs, regulatory affairs, commercialization, that sort of thing. And your team is paired up with a team of industry professionals and you get to partake in this case competition. So uh, not competition, but a showcase, a case showcase. So I'll give you an example is um, when I partook in this, we did a medical device um, that used AI. And so our mock project was introducing it to like the Canadian and European market, um, how it would pass through the regulations, what sort of applications we would do. And we did like a mock application as well as do a mock-up of the different finances and market access and stuff like that. So I found that super helpful. And again, the networking events, the mentorship stuff they did was also super helpful. But I think about trying to execute something like that in, you know, a city that's smaller like London. And I think that's one of the challenges. It's really, it is hard to get people out there for something so informal. Whereas here you just, you know, you ask them, hey, can you go five minutes down the street after work and stick around for an hour? Um, so I think one of the things considering when you consider, you know, where you're going to do your grad school and stuff like that, it does become an important conversation of what sort of experiences are available to me outside of, you know, outside of my lab and outside of this direct sort of. Yeah. And I, I know about that organization too. And I was trying to get a group together to clone the same thing at Western or create like a, a satellite site or something. And it's, it's logistically a nightmare. I think, if there is a positive to this whole apocalypse we're all living through, it's that it has accelerated the use of technology to have virtual meetings. And now, you know, it, 
it doesn't matter from the Gen Z or that could do it in their sleep to, you know, the 67 year old prof, everybody knows how to use zoom now. And so that levels the playing field and expands the opportunities for a lot of things. Like what we're doing right now, this, you know, it's facilitated by society's adoption of these technologies. Right. And I think that's incredible. That's something we shouldn't take lightly and should definitely be worked into everything. So, yeah, you might not be in a big city where it's easy to, to find professionals and different career paths, but you have a friend that works at the university there that knows someone that can introduce you to the group that does this, that can then just set up a virtual option. But again, I would say spending 200K on two administrators is not money well spent. Instead, spend that money on paying for flights for alumni to come in or partnering with that other city that works and shuttling the kids there in person if they need or, or whatever. Like use that money for something useful instead of just creating another administrative job. To me, like I get, I get really worked up about it because I just hate that. Like I, I'm someone that, you know, even when I was learning how to do math in elementary school and they say, show your work, I'm like, no, fuck you. I got the right answer. You can check it. So I don't like paperwork in general, but you know, it's to me when it, to me, it's just very disingenuous to tell someone that you're working on something on a solution to something when what you're doing is you're just doing reports on that thing or, or whatever, you know, it's like the same thing as the homeless crisis in California here. It's there's billions and billions of dollars put into the, helping the homeless and then what happens is that now being a homelessness administrator is now a, a great career path because you can make a couple hundred k if you're working in la and apparently there's like 50 people working on the homeless crisis making 200k a year that's like 10 million dollars just peeled off every year just for administrators so this bloat administrative bloat happens real easily if you let it start um, and that's what I saw at Western. Not to, you know, to play devil's advocate, I would say like, and not that administrative bloat in certain contexts is not a thing, but what about wanting sort of the best people for the job and reimbursing them at a competitive rate? Right. Like, I think that also factors into the context of things. Not necessarily with your example in grad school and how there should be a pot of money reserved for actually executing events and programs, which I think is is very valid. But is it necessarily fair to criticize like, just salaries of people who are being reimbursed to be in a competitive position? No, that that's not what I'm criticizing. I'm saying there is a zero output for that money. And so it's just extremely obvious that they're not doing anything because there's nothing to show for it. So clearly it's not working. And this, this is just a phenomenon that in general is true. Like um, something I learned about in high school was these things NGOs started to do in Africa called microloans, which was instead of giving $50 million to the local government that was corrupt and would swallow it all in their pocket, they would go to like a lady in the town that, you know, grew vegetables for the community and they'd give her the money directly and she would just expand her garden and then kids would come help her tend to the garden and then she would sell, you know, everything to the rest of the villagers and then they were able to build up their lives and go to school and then from just that, the money is useful, right? But if you have to give it in exactly the right place to the right person with the right objectives, it can't just be like, oh, there's a problem, we're going to label this money to go there and not think about it, and it's fixed. Yeah, it and then never I think there, works. it definitely has to be outcome measures, right? Like, these are metric of success, and I feel like they're transparent. So I think anytime you have a big issue that, you know, we are spending billions of dollars on, um, outcome measures and, and having transparency, especially when everything is online these days, I feel like periodic updates saying what exactly the progress is to date on an issue is very helpful for the public to know that money is being well spent. And I think I would encourage this in many different initiatives that 
governments propose, um, I would say, at election time or really just any time. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen without incentive. So I don't think there's enough people that know that's important enough to make noise about it. You know, it's just something that gets, that falls to the wayside when people aren't advocating, right? People don't even know what the problem is. They just are like, oh, I think we're not getting the whole picture, but I don't know what to do about it, so I'll go about my day. And then that person can go jerk people around still. It's not not an easy solution for any for anything like this. Just specifically with networking, you got to do that in person with people. That's, that's what it is. You're not going to do a PowerPoint presentation and then become a good networker. That's definitely not true. So that no, was just. But you did, you yeah. did make a good point now with the pandemic and, you know, people being very comfortable at virtual environments. Geography shouldn't be a barrier anymore into setting up these sorts of networking events, right? So I think that's something that's huge and has the potential to really change planning for these types of events for universities that are farther away from large metropolitan centers. I find it's a good mental exercise to try and find the positives. And so that's why I say this about the pandemic. You know, it's, it's been a, r- a real struggle. And, you know, there's, it's true for everyone. And for, for me, I can honestly say like the last couple of years have been the toughest time in my life. Like moving internationally during an apocalypse, not knowing anyone in the new country, no one being out and around, not being able to meet people, see people, look like a ghost town. Even when I'm meeting my new coworkers, we got to wear masks and things. It's all difficult. But to me, the positive in that is, yeah, first that this technology, this this virtual virtual meetings have become a thing. But also for me, now I know, okay, if another apocalypse happens, I'll probably make it. It'll be okay. I wasn't so sure <laughs> when it started. But, you know, the, there's something to learn from it. And... In grad school, there was a lot of tough times, but I tried to take the perspective that I'll get through it and I'll learn from it. And hopefully I won't have to go through the exact same thing and I can just maybe anticipate it coming and then maybe dodge it. Is there anything in grad school that, or a time in grad school that you found particularly difficult that you were able to push through that you think you could take a positive from it, even if it was uh, not so, such an upper at the time? I mean, I think in grad school, it's not a question of, is there one? <laughs> you know there's so many times That's like the that. perfect and, and answer. Through that, it's not going to be the last time. You're like, I hope this is the last time I ever encounter a situation <laughs> like this, but it's not. Um, I mean, if I were to give you one situation, it's probably my third or fourth year. I want to say my fourth year of my PhD. And we had a really big... Um, project where we were uh, looking at surgical induction of osteoarthritis in in rats and we had um, come to the almost the end of this project when we were harvesting at the end Um, and we had a really good system going it was myself and Dr. Michael Pest and Holly Dupuy and you know we worked together really well and our harvest days were quite long I'm going to say we started before 7 a.m. Wow. And after the end of our harvest day, I would have behavioral testing, which would probably take me another couple hours. So we'd probably wrap up around four or five, and then I would have another three or four hours, maybe five even of behavioral testing um, wow. with all of the wait times and acclimation. And I think, you know, things always happen that are unexpected. And so during that time, one of our lab members His wife got into a car accident. One of our other team members, her dad was diagnosed with cancer and only had limited time left to live. And these things are obviously bigger than our work schedule. So it's completely understandable that, you know, they went and they had to deal with their own things. And I tried to support them as best I could. But we still have to go on, unfortunately, with our science, right? Like, yeah. you know, we have so many things that we do that are time sensitive. So knowing that I had a week's worth, really, of 11-hour, 12-hour days left, 
that were originally done by this well-oiled machine of three. And what was going to happen when it was just me left was terrifying. Um, Mm. But I was really lucky that, you know, our team wasn't just us, but there are other people that were willing to lend their time. Some people may be free for two hour block or one hour block. And, you know, they could catch on really quickly to some of the skills we did. And even other really simple things like holding the water for a wet saw in the appropriate position, you wouldn't think, hey, there's a second person needed for this, but all of that helps. So I would say experiences like that really help build resilience Mm -hmm. um, and also teach you about the importance of having a great support network. Also from sort of a work perspective, teach you about the importance of, you know, training all of your team and making sure you have redundancies built up into your plan uh, for unexpected events. But yeah, I think that was, that was a big thing that happened. And even going through the motions for the rest of the week, okay, like usually you have 60 animals to inject with three people, we get this done a certain amount of time, you know, we're weighing all of them, testing all of them. But now with one person that can do all of those things, sometimes you just have to pick up your bootstraps and and go and you appreciate, you know, I appreciate so much the people that stepped in and helped with that. Um, Margaret, Lena, like those are two people that stepped in and helped. and, Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. I can't say enough good things about them. Yeah, they're awesome, mm-hmm. those two. And I'm glad that they sort of ended up where they were hoping. I know Margaret took off to med school. I wasn't expecting that personally, but I guess you guys knew she wanted to do that, and she made it. She must be done by now, right? Um, I think she has a year left, or maybe she finishes at the end of this year. It's gone yeah. by so fast. Yeah, it's crazy. I want to say, she, so she, she started in 2018? No. She started in 2018 or 2019. Yeah. It's, it's close. Soon. She'll be done yeah. soon. She'll be done yeah. soon. Yeah. And I know Melina just got a job, um, I think back in London. There's this new molecular mm-hmm. molecular biology company, I guess. They make Eliza's and stuff like that, but they could get a job. Yeah. And they weren't sure for a while. So I'm, I'm really happy that they, they got something that they can... Yeah, I work think it's, with it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I know it's it's getting late here. So I think we should have another chat at some point. And I want to get into the science, like what you actually did during your PhD, because I think it's really interesting. And the stuff you sort of started studying at that time when you were kind of thinking it's important, I think, has now really blown up, and a lot of people have adopted that it's really important, and have sort of carried on the work and things. So I want to know how you got that initial insight, how you feel about people overtaking your work. But I guess my last question is, could you tell us where you ended up now and just like really short what you do and if anything from grad school helped you get there? Sure. Um, just a succinct way is I'm now a clinical evaluator at Health Canada. So it's Canada's mm. version of the FDA. And nice. what I do is I help approve or not approve new drugs. So when a company has a new drug they want to file and they want to market it in Canada and sell it to Canadians, they send us all the science and I evaluate that science. So I essentially help make a recommendation after evaluating the risks and the benefits of the drug and weighing those with the targeted population, whether that's adults in Canada or pediatrics or geriatrics and for that specific disease. So mainly I look at autoimmune and endocrinology drugs, um, and also sometimes new clinical trial applications. Mm, cool. And yeah, that's, that's a cold note. In terms of what in grad school helps me form my current role or, or helped me um, in that way is in, in grad school, we do a lot of critical analysis. Mm. Um, so one thing that might be directly relevant is all of those times I worked as a reviewer or editor on a paper Right. And was we're critiquing that for a number of journals, which started in grad school, but also throughout my postdoc. Mm-hmm. And also probably all the communication that we do. 
of course, after a giant hesitation, you're like, what communication? What? I didn't but, even notice that. <laughs> it's just a pause yeah. for emphasis. Mm -hmm. And really just explaining our research and the way we make decisions and why we make decisions to our peers or to our bosses or supervisors and to the public in some cases when we've done that. It's the same sort of way that I would convey recommendations in my current role. Right? Some of it is meant for other scientific professionals, managers, supervisors, directors, and some of it's also meant for the public and for letting them see why and how we make our decision regarding a new drug. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. And I feel better that you're doing that. I know that you're there. I think we can trust you. Although when I'm trying to cure aging, I'm going to have to bug you probably, right? And you guys are going to have to let us treat aging as a disease. So keep that in the back of your mind. I'll file it away somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Anusha. Dr. Ratnaswaran, to be specific. It's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you again. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I know you could be doing plenty of other more fun things with your time. But thanks for indulging my little hobby here. Great to see you as always. I hope we can see each other in person one of these years, but I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it too. We definitely have to get burritos when you're back in the country. Yeah, for sure. Sounds good to me. So okay. this has been Bridge to the Bay with Dr. Varis with more to come.